Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this batch video of one shots taken from the HUPI subreddit. The links to the originals will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do so, please consider subscribing, because for those that don't, you will be visited later on by a biomass eating cloud of sentient nanites. Story number one, Bulwark, written by Lamaya. The year is 2352, humanity is on the brink of collapse. Their fleets shattered, their armies turned to glass, and a whole star systems burn with the fires of war. The Tumut Empire has turned their attention to the fledgling alliance, intending to shatter it, before it can grow to rival their might. As a grand armadas of gleaming behemoths sweep through the human fleets, holding what ground they can find. Their allies rush to earth in a desperate attempt to rally their aid and protect the civilian flotillas that they can find. The Empire, anticipating this, has sent the mightiest ships and most skilled admiral, First Warsmith Bellin, to see to its destruction. What follows is the account of Jean Bulwark McMahon of the SAS Earth Rising, a veteran of what would become known as the Grand Defense. Okay, we're gonna start filming here in a second. I turned to straighten myself in the chair before making eye contact with a small, frail man who sat across from me. You still wanna go through with this? Bloody right I do. There weren't many of us left, you know. Sometimes gotta tell the tale. The old man gave a toothy smile as he stared back at me with those pale blue eyes. And we're a go in three, two, one. So why don't you tell us who you are? starting with the name and always the quickest way to get them talking. My name is G. McMahon, and I am the captain of the battleship SAS Earth Rising. It was a quick and precise response. Captain, do you mind telling me what role did you play in the war? Everyone knew the answer, but I felt it needed to be asked anyway. Well, our ship was one of the only human ships that managed to escape and get back to Earth during the initial onslaught. I was there when the Tumut's big ass demander showed up, and when I mean big, I mean damn near crapped myself when I saw a drop out of FTL at the edge of Seoul. He shook his head and frowned before continuing. I was tasked with the defense of Earth being the ranking officer and would like to add, for the record, that the battle was the first time I'd ever been a captain of a starship, let alone a flagship of a whole damn fleet. Would you be willing to go over the battle with us? I'm sure everyone would love to hear a first-hand account of what happened there. We've all seen the vids, but why don't you tell us what really happened? I gave a quick glance to my producer and he gave me a curt nod to continue. All right, I guess I'll start from the point where we saw the Amadi jump in. Like I said before, it was massive and I honestly didn't think that we would have a chance at all. So, I began preparations for Earth to be evacuated. There was no way in hell that we were going to win this fight, and I thought so better as to get as many of my people out as I could, while me and the boys threw ourselves at them with everything we had. This arms were crossed across his chest now, and I could see the whole demeanor turn hard and cold as the other veterans. With that decided, the next thing I did was gather up the ships I had. It wasn't much, a handful of human cruisers and frigates, a dozen or so Tellurian slip destroyers, a Vren carrier task force, and a swarm of Mobalan corvettes with a drone ship attached. In total, we had maybe 40 to 50 ships as we formed up to meet the torment between Mars and Earth. Well, I didn't have much of a plan and only relayed to the other ships that we had to delay them as long as we could. It was a suicide mission, so I gave an option to every captain in the fleet that they could cut loose and leave. To my surprise, no one did. Not even our allies. I could see the tears begin to flow down his cheeks. Take your time, we have all day. We can take a break whenever you want. I offered him a Kleenex and he waited for them to recompose himself. I can still hear their voices when they turned down that offer. Damn stubborn bunch that they were and damn good people. A fresh set of tears and some Kleenex later and he nodded indicating to continue. How long did it take the tournament to reach to a line? I noticed much of the crew were fixated on the man sitting in front of me. Hell, David wasn't even looking in his camera anymore. Not long at all. I don't remember the exact number, but it was a lot quicker than I was guessing. I was a little surprised at how quickly the dreadnoughts moved. 
regardless of their speed, and battle was joined in a short order, and it was immediately apparent that we were going to be beat to hell. To my surprise, and probably theirs, we were putting up one hell of a fight. With probably more luck than skill, we managed to disable one of the dreadnoughts in the first few salvos. Jean let out a hearty laugh. I'm sure that damned Belen was furious, but anyways, after those first few minutes, everything turned into a melee where we tried everything that we could to keep them away from Earth. The Rin carrier, having lost its drone connection, rammed another dreadnought and split it in two. The sacrifice brought us down to 23 barely functioning ships. We were brought down to 18 after two of our own cruisers overloaded their cores to take out a group of their destroyers as their frigates were with them. Shortly after that, and three more losses later, my comms officer gave me the craziest report. He called out to me that the pirate ships were inbound. He was grinning with a toothy grin again. Pirate ships? I thought it was strictly military vessels that were in the part of the engagement. Now this was something I never heard of before. You heard me. Pirate ships. You know the scourge of the trade lanes, bandits of the belts, and the scoundrels of the stars. Apparently, they caught wind of what was going on, and came streaming out of nowhere. Black squids, red fists, the critters, amongst other groups, were all broadcasting to us that they were on their way, and to hold out a little longer. Jean was in a fool on a belly laugh at this point. That wasn't even the last crazy reports I received. After the pirates started streaming into the swarm of Termit, I got another report. Want to take a guess of what it was? I was a little taken aback by the sudden question that barely stammered out. I have no idea. My comms officer reported that he just picked up a whole load of civilian transponder signals on a direct course for our little battle. They were mining vessels, starliners, freight haulers, you name it, it was there. Hundreds of them began to slip in all around the battle. Many of them weren't even armed, and they were coming in hot. Each and every one of them were aimed directly at the behemoths of our ragtag fleet, which is barely holding back. He paused to wipe away the fresh set of tears and let out a long sigh, returning a hard demeanor. In the end, we won, but I want to add, at the start of the battle, we had roughly 50 starships. Battered and bruised, we ended the battle with 101. End of story number one. Story number two. A Shrine to a Small God, written by Incongruous Goat. It was my second day aboard the ship, and I noticed a little shrine in the corner of the engine room. It wasn't much of a shrine, really, a pedestal upon which it was sat a standard cargo container. The deity's icon was just printed image popped up against the wall and the offering space before it were all the world was a pile of random junk picked willy-nilly from various places around the ship. Old utensils from the mess, spare bolts from the engine room, worn-out cleansing stones from the head. The icon itself was strange too. Whomever or whatever the image was supposed to represent, it wasn't the same species as us. It certainly didn't look like any god that I was familiar with, or anything particularly worth revering for that matter. It did seem to be carrying something, but the object, whatever it was, was bulky and unwieldy, and certainly not the prized tool of a god. It took me a little while to work out who had put it up, though given the location, the answer should have surprised me less than it did. It was the chief engineer who had put it up, not some nervous greenhorn, much like myself, but the chief engineer herself. She had left it alone most of the time, only making an offering before attempting a particularly complicated repair. I had heard of some of the deities with specific domains before, but a god of complex repairs seemed a bit much, so I set out to ask the chief about the shrine. This was a long time ago, you understand, the chief said to me when I broached the question at dinner one evening. I was still in school, and I had gotten a short-term posting aboard a human ship as part of an exchange program. Ever met a human? No, odd bunch. Real hard to get a handle on their motivations. Brilliant shipbuilders, though. They own most of the shipping in this part of known space. Anyway, I was all set up to spend a few months aboard one of their freighters as an apprentice engineer. Long haul, we were traveling from Frontier Planet, Shatner's World, to it was called, carrying supplies for the human colony that had just set up shop there. 
tech mostly, computers, hardware, and whatnot. Stuff that they couldn't make by themselves. Oh, and all the bits needed to make a water filtration plant. Pipes, filters, bearings, valves, seals, everything except walls. Apparently, the colonists had just about outgrown the capacity of the distillation rig, and were looking for something a bit less ramshackle. The trip out there was well enough, a few hiccups with the main drive when left to port, but nothing too concerning. It was when there were ten parsecs from Shatner's world that everything went to perdition. One minute we were cruising along at standard speed, the next we'd fallen into normal space, floating adrift. The controls were dead and the drive was leaking coolant all over the engine room. We shut everything down and started taking the drive apart with a thorough inspection. Didn't take us long to find the problem. It was pretty clear what had gone wrong. The drive cord broken. I mean, completely wrecked, in tiny pieces all over the enclosure. Any normal crew would have probably given it to inevitable at this point. A ship with a busted core drive ain't going anywhere any time soon. The sublight engines worked, sure, but we weren't going to get to Shatner's world on those before we died of old age. The human chief, though, he had just gathered up all the engineers aboard, sat us down at a table in the mess, handed out printouts of every single asset and piece of equipment that we had on board, and told us to get working like it was any other problem. We all sat silent for a while, then one of the other engineers spoke up. I think I've got an idea, chief, she said. It ain't pretty, in fact. It's MacGyver to Hullenbach, but I think that we might be able to get us Shatners in one piece. Before I could ask who this MacGyver was, she launched one of the most long-winded and convoluted technical explanations that I'd ever heard. I must have lost track of what she was saying within five minutes. I was still a student, you understand, and a lot of it was over my head. The jeep seemed to like it, though, and before long we were all back in the engine room with half the contents of the cargo bay in tow. What ensued was and is the finest engineering work in all my years. Those mad fools jury-rigged an entire drive core, a freaking drive core, a device so precise and delicate that it's construction that it is normally takes a dedicated industrial facility on a core world to make one. And they made one from some random bits of computing hardware, some low-grade stainless steel pipes, and a pile of magnets that they got from the rotor of an electric motor and a greasy old oil rag. It couldn't have been physically possible, and yet it worked. We got to Shatner's world only a week behind schedule. It was there that I saw firsthand the power of MacGyver, god of the jury rig, lord of all things with whatever is on hand. I don't think I'll ever be able to recapture the sublime perfection of experience there aboard the human ship, but... Every now and again, I see a way to use some bit of hardware in a way that was never intended. Or, I get a small Jerry rig running just so, and in that moment, I feel MacGyver smiling upon me, and I get back the piece of glory of that magnificent repair. And that greenhorn is why there is a shrine to a human god in the engine room. End of story number two. Story number three. From a fracking boat, written by John Falkirk. Audio recording of Dr. Professor Kakronikli vs. Prath Sutilakera, Institute of Mecha Organics. Those new humans! Humans, how? How did they? I can't. What even? Let me start from the beginning. We are all familiar with the primary problem of Mecha Organics. We can build a synthetic replacement for every organ in the body. One that will last longer and function better than the original piece of obsolete wetware replaced. Even the brain. But what we have never been able to do is the crown jewel of our discipline. The holy grail, to use a <clears throat> human expression. And I feel that we will soon be doing that a lot more soon. Is to transfer the conscious into a new brain in such a way that is the same person and not merely a copy of them exists there, to preserve the originality of the consciousness, and not a mere copy. That we have never been able to do. Every advancement, every new plan, for a thousand years has been a dead end. Immortality has been denied to us. One stumbling block from achieving it, a single issue, 
Everything else was fixed. All the other organs could be replaced at need. Any body part that you could care to name. Replaced at need. But not the brain. Five years ago, their time unit, the humans were introduced to the galactic stage. They were introduced to the final problem of mechaorganics. Their own version of the field having been advanced in leaps and bounds in those five years as we shared our tech with them. One year ago, I got my first human intern, Dave Thomas. Dave was a bit hard to get used to in the first cycle at the university. Slightly too tall for my office door, one fewer digits on each manipulatory appendage than is advisable for our keyboards. The usual human-related problems, but he was a hard worker. If a bit unserious at times, the human concept of a, um, pun caused endless productivity lost in the week after he's introduced it. Seriously, what kind of joke gets better as it gets worse? No sensible species has humor like that. As he was catching up on the lab notes about a month into his internship, I explained to him the problem, and he thought for a second. I'll be right back, he shouted suddenly, jumping up and sprinting from the laboratory. He returned a few time slots later with a textbook from the human philosophy course of all things. He excitedly showed me a page. There was a picture of this boat, an ancient boat, not even one of the engines, one powered by oars and a sail, not even a proper tiller for crying out loud. And he says to me, I have the solution. You see, apparently in human mythology, there was apparently this warrior named Theseus, stupid name by the way, who sailed from place to place on a ship slaying monsters that mostly seemed to be earth animal heads on oversized human bodies. During his travels, this idiot managed to break every individual part of his ship, but one at a time, each having been replaced one at a time. The ship never ceased being a ship. At no point did the ship become not a ship and meaningful distinguishment could be made at any point to claim that it started being a new ship even though it was made of completely different parts by the end of the journey. I opened my mandibles to explain to Dave why that was an interesting story, but unhelpful, when I realized that I couldn't. There was no reason that it couldn't work. Programming a small swarm of nanites to replicate individual cells identically as child's play, installing them a single cell in replacement of another, again, simple, and a fast with modern nanites. There is nothing to stop this from happening contiguously, save the need for raw materials. Nanites can be programmed to fetch them from a digestive tract. With ease and convincing a person to increase their food consumption is easier. Difficult to not do in fact. With the pre-Dave technology, we could give a thousand years to any being without difficulty before running hard and fast into the problem. At a rate of but a quarter million cells per human day, in that time, the brain can become completely synthetic, now of infinite durability, and the consciousness is contiguous throughout. We solved immortality with a ghost story about a fracking human boat. End of story number three. End of the dispatch video. If you wish to support the author or the channel, all the relevant links are down below. But the easiest way would be to share this video far and wide to as many unsuspecting people as possible. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good time, and I'll see you then. Cheers.